Hello and welcome to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. With me tonight is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. And you can find him at the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway, as well as a few other locations throughout town. The Endoscopy Center is always a great place to get started, however, if you want to try and find a location. We'll talk about probably some of those throughout the program. But tonight's topic is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease and Barrett's esophagus, which can sometimes be a result of, of, of GERD. We'll get into those details throughout the program tonight. We are live this evening. They'll pop up the little number in a few minutes, I'm sure, and they will have that there for the remainder of the program. So if you have a question or a comment, we would love to hear from you. Specifically, if it relates to GERD or Barrett's esophagus, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, if you have something related to gastroenterology in general, we can probably get that taken care of as well. But if you have a question on GERD or Barrett's esophagus, this would be a perfect night for you to give us a call. The number is on the screen and it will be on the screen throughout the program. The um, new number, it's a little bit new, it's been here for a few months now, but if you're used to the old number like I am, this one is a little bit different. So 850-972-2642 is the number. And again, that will be on the screen throughout the program. We would love to hear from you if you have a question or comment about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or Barrett's esophagus. Dr. Dobbin, that was a big introduction, but it's great to see you again. Nice to see you too. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's get started with the basics. Sure. First, what is gastroenterology? So gastroenterology is a uh, branch of medicine that specializes in disorders of the digestive tract. Any conditions uh, anywhere from the mouth all the way down to the anus and all the organs in between. Plus we also deal with liver disease and pancreatic disorders. So it's something that covers kind of a wide range of Absolutely. issues, but specifically tonight we're going to be talking about gastroesophageal reflux, That's GERD. Right. So tell us a little bit about what is GERD and what does it primarily affect? So gastroesophageal reflux disease is uh, basically reflux of contents from the stomach up into the esophagus that either cause troublesome symptoms to a patient. Uh, it's, typical symptoms are either heartburn, uh, a t medical term that we use is called pyrosis, but it's this burning sensation that rises up into the chest. Regurgitation is another symptom. Uh, sometimes people will have other unusual symptoms mm -hmm. also, which we'll uh, talk about some. But also, gastroesophageal reflux disease can be defined as not necessarily based on your symptoms, but on injury or damage that it causes to the esophagus. And I'm assuming we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. We also. will. We so. absolutely will talk about some of those things in a little bit more detail as well. And the esophagus, again, is the kind of tube that That's connects. Right. Go ahead, tell us what yeah. that is. Yeah, it's this, it's, we call, you know, the, the generic term is it's the swallowing tube. The esophagus is what connects your mouth so that when you chew up your food and you initiate your swallow, this tube allows that food bolus to then transport down into the stomach. So it's a conduit or a means of getting the food from your mouth into your stomach. Part of the digestive process does start in the esophagus with saliva breaking down some of that food, but the, the major role is, is the transport. And what is at the bottom of the esophagus that's supposed to prevent right. that reflux from happening? Yeah, so we all have something called the lower esophageal sphincter, which is actually made up of a couple of different uh, muscle groups. And it's sort of like a little flapper valve that stays closed until a food bolus gets down to the bottom of the esophagus. So the esophagus that contracts like a, a, a mm -hmm. group of muscle contractions to push the food down. When it gets down into the bottom of the esophagus, the bottom of that swallowing tube, the muscle relaxes, the sphincter relaxes, and the bolus can then go into the stomach, and then it's supposed to close and stay closed so that stuff doesn't come back up. Doesn't always happen though, so. And that's when people experience reflux symptoms, is if that sphincter relaxes inappropriately or at the wrong time, mm -hmm. contents can rise back up into the chest that can be very irritating, or back up into the esophagus, which is felt in the chest, and that can be very uh, irritating and cause symptoms of heartburn, mm -hmm. sometimes chest pain, sometimes mm -hmm. some uh, difficulty with food passing into the stomach. Uh, 
So that's about how long is the esophagus? About how long? And so about you know where does it come to in the chest? Because I think that's one of the reasons that sometimes reflux gets confused with heart disease. Is right. I think it's higher up in the chest than people think. Yeah. So the esophagus basically starts up in the upper uh, or lower throat region, sort of above this area of your sternum, mm -hmm. and then it comes all the way down to the lower part where the ribs come together. Mm -hmm. And that junction is called the esophagogastric junction. You have a breathing muscle, your diaphragm, that separates the abdominal cavity from your chest cavity. And that diaphragm is also uh, sort of the lower point of the esophagus too. The, the lower esophageal sphincter, the gastroesophageal mm -hmm. junction where, where it all comes together, is supposed to sit right at that level of the diaphragm. Sometimes it's above the diaphragm if someone has a hiatal hernia, that's where part of the stomach mm -hmm. sits up, uh, above the diaphragm in the chest, could put people at risk for having some reflux disease. Um, but that's that's the length, is essentially the length of your breast, your, of your, your ribs almost, your ribs. from it, the top it, to the bottom right, right there. Yeah. So when someone is having reflux and they're having these symptoms, you don't necessarily feel it right no, here not usually not, not usually so tell us a little bit about yeah, when so you're typical, feeling that where is it yeah so typical reflux symptoms are usually felt by, behind the sternum behind the breastbone it could be felt on either side of the the breastbone mm -hmm. also and again as you alluded to it's why some people might mistake reflux symptoms as having a heart attack it's why they actually call it heartburn that that symptom of pyrosis which is that warm, burning, rising feeling that you get in your chest is can sometimes be mistaken as having a heart attack because it sits right there and causes a burning sensation that people sometimes think is their heart. And especially if it's something that feels severe, that feels like, wow, yeah. this is really painful, and if you haven't had it before, you don't know what it is, it can definitely be confused with a heart problem. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and Unfortunately, when acid or other contents from the stomach reflux up into the chest, uh, this, the esophagus tries to get rid of that. It tries to push it back down into the stomach. And sometimes that can result in an intense spasm, which can also intensify the burning injury that occurs from sometimes damage to the esophagus or maybe just an intense spasm. That can be absolutely excruciating for some folks. We've had a call come in, so I want to get to the phone. We appreciate all of those calls, so let me see if I can get to you. Hello there, and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Dobbin? Hello, am I on? Yes, you are. Go ahead. All right. My question was, um, lately um, I've been changing my diet a little, so uh, I've been eating healthier. But the problem I've been having is um, I've been having a, a little chest pain, but it's starting to go to my back, um, and I don't know what this one is on. Like, I have pains in my upper back. I don't know, is it coming from my chest, or is it in my back and going to my chest? Um, or is it something that I'm eating causing both? Uh, well, a good question, and probably a kind of complicated question. Yeah, so a, a lot of it depends on the type of pain that you're having. Um, if it's only related to when you're eating, uh, pain that, that is it starts in the chest sometimes reflux symptoms can radiate to the back but you also have to think of things like the gallbladder that can sometimes uh, cause pain that might feel like reflux disease but then you could have radiation into the upper right part of your back and that's typically common for someone who with gallbladder disease who's eating fattier foods uh, or greasier foods um, the other thing Thing that's always a little concerning though is you know depending on the age of a particular patient including yourself if uh, you know you have to always be concerned that there could be some heart issues also that could be causing pain radiating to other parts of your of your body up into the neck or into the left arm uh, sometimes pain in the back can be related to problems with some of the vascular vasculature including the aorta in your chest it's not common for reflux to present with back pain it's far more common for reflux pain to really be limited to in the breastbone and sometimes rising up 
above the breastbone, even up as high as into the throat, maybe even with some acid regurgitation. So if you're having chest pain and some associated pain in the back, that might actually be indicative of something more significant than reflux disease, and that's probably worth getting looked at a little bit closer. Well, thank you so much for answering my question. You have a good night. All thank right. you so much. We appreciate your call. So it kind of leads to another question of, are there other symptoms that could be related? We talked about the burning sensation. Oh, yeah. We talked about, you know, kind of not feeling that regurgitation, a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, dry cough, that's mm -hmm. something that I've heard related to. Talk about that. Right, so there are what we consider to be typical esophageal symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so esophageal symptoms are that, that, that heartburn, that burning, mm -hmm. the regurgitation. Uh, some people will get an acidic taste in their mouth, uh, especially if they belch. Uh, there's something called water brash, which is this excessive salivation that some people can get uh, because the, the body is trying to make some more saliva mm -hmm. to neutralize the effects of the acid. Those are typical reflux symptoms. And even nausea, just kind of feeling queasy, can be a symptom of reflux disease. But some of the uh, atypical symptoms or, or non-esophageal symptoms include an unexplained cough, non-productive, like you alluded mm -hmm. to, so a dry cough, but just irritating, especially at night when you're lying down. Voice hoarseness, kind of like what my voice <laughs> sounds like right now. Uh, um, that, that's also something. And this sensation of having to clear your throat uh, constantly, mm -hmm. like, like <clears throat> you know, doing this or kind of feeling like you got a little bit of thickness in the throat or a little phlegm that's constantly mm -hmm. there, that too can be an, a non-esophageal symptom of reflux disease also. Other things are chest pain, as we alluded mm -hmm. to, uh, that might be associated with some spasms. People can sometimes get the sensation of food getting a little stuck mm -hmm. uh, as it goes down from the mouth uh, into the stomach, kind of gets hung up in the chest. And that could be from some inflammation related to reflux or some spasm in the esophagus, maybe even some structural problems uh, with the esophagus itself, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, yeah, those are, there's a, a, a variety of a symptoms. A lot of symptoms, a lot of symptoms. We've had another call come in, so I wanna make sure that we get to the phone. Again, we certainly appreciate the call. Hello, and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Dobbin? Uh, yes, thanks for taking my question. I um, really am concerned about um, why sometimes when I eat spicy food or whatever, I may get mild heartburn or indigestion or something like that, but then other times it can be just really, really painful, and uh, I don't know why um, sometimes it's not painful and sometimes it's really, really painful. And then my final question is, when do you go ahead and finally start taking the medicine? When, when do you know that it's time to maybe quit taking Tums and Pepto-Bismol and go to something a little more strong? And I'll listen to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your call. We appreciate it. So a lot of the times the intensity of the heartburn or the, the, um, the symptoms that you're having can, can vary um, for, for really no apparent reason whatsoever. Uh, but of the majority of the time, it's because of the, the presence of injury that might be in the esophagus. If there is esophagitis that is occurring from repeated acid exposure and injury and you start to actually get some breaks in the lining of the esophagus itself, uh, that can in increase the intensity of the of the food. And so it's sort of a progressive injury that occurs mm -hmm. over time. And a, a lot of the times the esophagus will try to heal itself and then the intensity can go down. You expose yourself to those foods that are what we call refluxogenic. So spicy foods or caffeinated foods or carbonated foods that tend to promote reflux uh, will then all of a sudden uh, cause that injury to recur again and it might make those symptoms a little bit worse. And so that's when you start figuring, okay, I gotta start doing something about this because I'm having these symptoms. And if you're having symptoms, you know, maybe once or twice a week, you could probably manage that with antacids or um, maybe even something like Zantac, uh, ranitidine, mm -hmm. or 
Pepsid, Famotidine, uh, some of the over-the-counter, what we call histamine type 2 receptor antagonists. And those can be used on demand and they tend to work fairly effectively and rapidly to sort of knock the symptoms down. You, if you start having symptoms more frequently than twice a week, and certainly if you're having daily symptoms and they become unpredictable with almost any type of dietary ingestion that you make, that's when you really have to start thinking about being on some prescription strength medications. See your primary doctor, come and see us in gastroenterology, um, and, and normally you will be prescribed something. And there's different approaches to treating reflux disease. You can start with less aggressive treatment and, and every couple of weeks see how you've responded to that. And if you need something stronger, you can step up your therapy mm -hmm. to something that works more potently to reduce your acid. Or you can get real aggressive up front and say, let's, let's hit this hard, we'll use a real strong acid reducer. But then with time, we'll reassess if your symptoms go away, maybe start to reduce therapy potentially even come off therapy. One of the major keys to the treatment of reflux disease is diet and lifestyle modification. You, you really need to pay attention to what you're eating. And we're gonna talk about that yeah. in a lot more detail. It's time for us to take our first break, but when we come back, we are gonna talk about some of the diet and lifestyle things that you can do to maybe reduce your instances of reflux. We'll be right back with more Health Talk. weight. It's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight. We do. We exercise. We eat healthier. We try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Has anyone ever said you are the picture of health? You look healthy, you feel fine, but that may not be the full picture. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over 50. It doesn't always cause symptoms, but it can be prevented. Screening can find precancerous polyps so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Get screened. Make sure you are the picture of health. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. With me tonight is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with the Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. You can find him at the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway. And tonight we are talking about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and Barrett's esophagus. And before the break, we were saying that diet and lifestyle play a significant role in reflux. And and I want to talk about that in a little bit of detail, but I, I kind of want to go backwards for just one second and say reflux itself is pretty common. At what point does just having reflux become reflux disease? So uh, again, um, everybody has physiologic reflux. I mean, there, people will o always have reflux events, especially in the context of eating. When it becomes pathologic it's it's either because it's causing injury to the esophagus and sometimes you can only assess that either through x-ray testing or sometimes through doing an upper endoscopy and actually looking at the mm -hmm. esophagus um, or it becomes it, it gets defined as reflux disease when it causes troublesome symptoms for the person when an individual is all of a sudden having these symptoms enough that they feel the need that they have to start taking medicine or they it, it affects or impacts their ability to sometimes sleep at night because they're waking up because they're having 
some mm -hmm. regurgitation of food or reflux symptoms. Or in the middle of a business meeting, they're like, oh, I'm having this heartburn, they're having a hard time concentrating. That's when you get concerned about it actually being reflux disease because it's causing the symptoms or, and potentially causing injury. All right, we, um, I want to talk a little bit about diet and lifestyle briefly. Sure. We've had a call come in. Let's take the call first, sure. and that might actually lead us into this in a little bit more. Yeah. So, hello there, and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Dobbin? I was wondering, a stomach flu, when you uh, can't keep nothing down for a few days, could it be a stomach flu? I had a flu earlier this year, and I'll listen to your comments. Okay, thank you very much for the call. We appreciate it. Okay, bye. So, we talked about regurgitation a little bit, but when you're vomiting and things... A little bit different. It's different than reflux. Yeah, but. so, so um, you know, when, when someone has a stomach flu or anything that sort of... Uh, prevents the stomach from emptying effectively, they tend to have more symptoms of nausea. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that nausea can be a symptom of reflux disease. It's not a typical symptom of reflux disease. Uh, but if you're feeling nauseated and you're actually vomiting and you're bringing up contents from the stomach that are, you know, stuff that you ate earlier in the day or you're just vomiting up bile, um, that's different than reflux disease. Right? Reflux and, and regurgitation with reflux disease, sort of like you belch and you get little partially digested particles of food, or you'll actually get sort of the acid kind of rise from the stomach, or even sometimes bile will rise from the stomach, cause this sour taste in the mouth or even a burning taste in the mouth, but you're not actually projecting out a, a bunch of emesis, a bunch of, of vomit mm -hmm. with that. Um, although some people with really bad hiatal hernia and really significant reflux disease, particularly at night, can have a significant amount of regurgitation. But regurgitation is a little bit more spontaneous at times. Like, uh, you know, it can happen in the context of a belch or it can just happen like you could be sitting there and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I just got something rose up over there. Um, whereas vomiting is, you know, it starts in the abdomen, it starts mm -hmm. in the stomach, and then it kind of pro progresses to where the contents come out of the esophagus and so. out of the mouth. And <coughs> Excuse me, so if there is vomiting, then it probably isn't reflux, it probably, it could be flu, something like that. That's it, that's right. Or something completely different, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, so sorry. You know, ate something that didn't agree with you, uh, food poisoning type stuff, that's all part of it. Let's talk about diet. Sure. What are some of the things that you said kind of lead to reflux yeah. or things that you can eat that would help prevent reflux if there are such things? Well, the, the, hard, the second one is a little bit harder uh, because there really hasn't <clears throat> been any proven type of diet that is <clears throat> um, preventative for causing reflux. As I mentioned, everybody has some degree of physiologic mm -hmm. reflux. Um, where it just happens naturally but doesn't cause symptoms or doesn't cause injury or damage. I, there was not too long ago a study that looked at a Mediterranean diet and actually felt that you can treat reflux disease without medications by simply doing a, a typical Mediterranean diet uh, and might even <sighs> heal up some injury but I, I don't know that there's any other specific type of diet that is been shown or proven to be truly preventative of reflux disease, but things that cause reflux, <laughs> it's a lot more common to ingest things that do cause reflux. Um, the, the, the typical things are spicy foods, that's what we think about, or foods that are very citric uh, based, uh, like um, uh, stuff with a lot of lemon content or grapefruit or things of that nature. Caffeine, uh, is a pretty significant culprit for reflux disease because it causes that lower esophageal sphincter that we talked about earlier to, to relax a little bit more regularly. Uh, same with carbonated beverages. Uh, they, they make you belch and when you're belching more you have a tendency mm -hmm. to have more reflux. Um, peppermints will actually cause problems with reflux disease. So you know you're chewing on breath mints to 
you know that can that can create some problems for you um, fatty foods though are a big big uh, culprit also fatty or greasy foods and, and part of the reason for that is because they slow down the emptying of your stomach and if your stomach is not emptying and it's and you have contents and food just sitting in there then you're going to get a lot more reflux in those sorts of instances and another one that nobody wants to hear is chocolate chocolate is uh, definitely been a culprit with reflux also. So it sounds like if you go out and have a large meal of there greasy fatty foods or saucy, you know, tomato saucy tomato things, foods, those yeah. kind of things, and then you have a chocolate dessert and a cup of coffee, and then on your way out the door you pick up a peppermint, you're kind of asking for trouble. Especially if you go to bed within 30 minutes of that large meal, yes, absolutely. Which so, Speaking of lifestyle, <laughs> which leads us know, right into lifestyle. lifestyle. That's what I was going to you know, say. So, you, you know, one of the things that can definitely promote reflux is laying down too quickly after any type of meal, but especially an evening meal that tends to be your larger meal of the day. And our general rule of thumb is you want to wait at least two hours before assuming any type of a of a supine position laying down. So, you don't want to eat a big meal and then lay all the way back in your recliner or lay down on the couch and watch TV. You want to stay upright, walk around the house a little bit, maybe even go for, you know, a little bit of a walk or something like mm -hmm. that. You definitely don't want to go to bed within two hours of eating because you, you lose the effect of gravity in that upright position. And when you're laying down, especially if you have something like the hiatal hernia that mm -hmm. I mentioned, or a weak lower esophageal sphincter, that will promote reflux uh, very significantly. Um, other things though, you, you know, you don't want to eat and then do a lot of bending over and doing work uh, mm -hmm. out in the yard or anything that requires a lot of bending over because that'll put pressure on that lower subgel sphincter to force things up. We used to say, you know, you shouldn't wear tight fitting clothing if you have reflux disease because that could create some issues for you. I don't know if that's necessarily true, mm -hmm. but um, uh, you know, other things that could potentially make reflux a little bit worse are smoking and alcohol consumption, although alcohol is one of those kind of hit or miss things mm -hmm. also. If you're having a lot of carbonated alcoholic beverages, that's going to be problematic for you, and some people really struggle with red wine also. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, But smoking for sure can you know, lower the, the, the tone of the, of the lower esophageal sphincter and that can promote reflux disease also. We've talked about when you do have an episode, if you don't sure. have reflux a lot, but you do have a kind of flare up or you go out for one of these meals or something like that, that you can treat it, typically you can treat the symptoms yourself. You can take some Tums or some Rolaids or something like that and it should get better. Should get better. It's just when you start having those symptoms or when you start having the reflux itself more than two or three times a week. That's exactly right. It's, it's based on the frequency. If, you're, if you are having frequent symptoms, and that's generally, we say, you know, more than two times a week, then you want to be on something mm -hmm. to, to treat the reflux disease because more than likely you do have reflux disease because the symptoms are present and they're there present often um, you, you want to you want to get that treated so so if you're popping tums after every meal if, if you're if you're popping tums more than twice a week uh, you're you're probably needing to do something a little bit more one of the other things that we can talk about a little bit as far as lifestyle changes go is weight That's how right. does weight affect reflux well the the heavier you are uh, obesity is a risk factor for developing reflux disease. It, it uh, tends, especially central obesity around the, the abdomen, um, it puts pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter, especially if you have a hiatal hernia, and will definitely promote reflux disease. It's also a risk factor for the development of Barrett's esophagus in the setting of reflux disease, which is something we'll talk about, mm -hmm. as is smoking is a risk factor for the development of uh, of uh, Barrett's esophagus. So, um, but but definitely, if you are over your ideal body weight and you have reflux disease, losing weight will make the management of your reflux disease 
much, much easier, almost to the point that you might be able to eventually come off of medication or at least some of the stronger medicines that we have available to use for the treatment of reflux disease. And it doesn't always have to be a huge amount of weight that you Not lose. Not at all, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know that there's a set number, but, you know, general rule of thumb is, you know, if you're uh, over your, you know, if you're obese or over your ideal body weight, if you lose somewhere between 5 and 10% of that weight over a course of about three to six months, you will notice market improvement, market improvement in your in your symptoms. Something to think about. Yeah. It's time for us to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the repercussions from having persistent gastroesophageal reflux disease like Barrett's esophagus. We'll get to that when we come right back with more Health Talk. It's impossible to replace anybody that you love. She was my my great role model, my Grammy Keaton. It was pretty much of a shock for us when she got colon cancer. We were, none of us were prepared for that. Here's the deal, and, and this is the bottom line here. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over the age of 50. And you know what, this is one that you can prevent. Just get screened, okay? I know how precious life is right now. We can all do this. You can do it, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it, okay? How's that for a deal? Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. With me is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. And tonight's topic is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease and Barrett's esophagus. We're gonna be talking a little bit about Barrett's esophagus kind of for the next couple of segments of the program. But I wanna finish up and kind of talk from where we were talking about some of the diet and lifestyle things that can either contribute to GERD or potentially, if you avoid them, can maybe help reduce some of the symptoms that you're having. And we haven't talked in too much detail about some of the medications. We talked about popping Tums or taking some Rolaids, things like that. We've talked about some of the different things that you can get over the counter. But if someone is having persistent GERD, Dr. Dobbin, let's talk about what are some of the things, once they've tried those things and they don't seem to be working as well, and sure. it, at a point where they need some prescription medication, what are some of the options that are available? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as we talk, as we mentioned, uh, antacids are are generally the first thing that people go to, and you know if you're having symptoms once a week, it's not not unreasonable to use those antacids. Quick quick acting, they neutralize the acid. They usually work within 15 minutes or so, but usually a lot a lot quicker. Uh, but they don't have a, a long-term efficacy. So the next step up from that would be something like ranitidine, uh, Zantac, or, or famotidine, Pepsid. Cimetidine is another one that's out there that's Tagamet. Um, these are what are called histamine type 2 receptor antagonists. The acid-producing cells in the, in the stomach actually have different receptors that uh, different substances will attach to those receptors and stimulate acid production. One of them is histamine type 2. So those medicines were designed to block those receptors and, and reduce acid production somewhat. And they're very good if you're having symptoms maybe three, two to three, three to four times a week. Um, and your diet and your lifestyle changes are not enough to kind of get it under control. And you can use them on demand. And they'll generally take a little bit longer to, to, to 
activate, but they'll give you a little bit longer uh, relief of your symptoms. But sometimes you have to take it to the next step and use either those particular medicines at prescription strengths, which are a little bit higher sometimes than what you can get over the counter, and using them twice a day to kind of keep things under control. Or you go to what we call the, the bigger guns, which are the proton pump inhibitors. And these actually block the acid producing pump on the cell itself. So it really has a very profound effect at reducing your acid production in your stomach. It doesn't shut it off entirely because your body's still able to make some acid. And people all, will always ask, well, if I don't have acid, will I be able to digest mm -hmm. my food? You absolutely will still be able to digest your food and break it down. It's just that by lowering that acid significantly by, by blocking the acid pump itself, you will get a much more reliable and effective control of your acid reflux symptoms. And if there's any injury or damage in the esophagus that has occurred, that's from acute injury, like mm -hmm. acute erosions that, that, that have just happened as a result of that acid being up there, it's very effective at getting that healed. Um, the problem is that, that these medicines with long-term use can have some issues or cause some problems with absorption of certain vitamins or minerals, so uh, vitamin B12 absorption, iron absorption, magnesium absorption can be affected with long-term use. And if you are gonna have to use these medicines for long periods of time, it's important to pay attention to those things mm -hmm make sure you might either be supplementing or at least having those blood levels checked periodically to make sure that you're not manifesting any signs of malabsorption. Postmenopausal women can have problems with osteoporosis develop a little bit more readily when they're on proton pump inhibitors. Um, there's been some stuff in the literature here, now please keep in mind, not very good studies and the studies are not really good at, at at proving causality, meaning that if you take this medicine, this happens. But there's been some implications that long-term use of proton pump inhibitors can cause problems with your kidneys or with your liver, potentially even um, increase your risk of developing dementia. I don't know that those are very accurate studies, but you have to pay attention to those things because sure. Proton pump inhibitors are oftentimes overused by patients or overprescribed. And you always want to reassess, well, do I still need to remain on such a therapy? And sometimes you can wean people off of those medications if their reflux symptoms are under control. And, uh, and they can be managed with either diet, lifestyle, or periodic use of those lesser medicines mm -hmm. that we talked about. Another option for the treatment of reflux disease is surgery. There are some surgeries that are available uh, out there, uh, different ways of reinforcing the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, there's actually a new surgery that's become available where a um, string of magnetic beads get placed around the lower part of the esophagus so that you're not actually taking the stomach itself and wrapping it around mm -hmm. the esophageal uh, sphincter but you're placing these uh, metallic beads and they stay closed until you swallow, but they're on a string and when a bolus goes through, it allows the, the sphincter muscle to open up and allow things to pass through. So there are surgical options. The, the problem is that a lot of the times those surgical options will lose their efficacy over time. Uh, maybe 10 years, 20 years down the road, patients find that they're back on mm -hmm. anti-reflux therapy because the effectiveness starts to go away. Plus, anytime you have a big surgery, there's always the risk of complications from sure. the surgery, some other issues that can come up. But it's definitely an option for some people. And it's, you know, if medications work, but someone doesn't want to take medications long-term, that might be a good option. If the medications don't work, to control your reflux, mm -hmm. you have to start thinking, well, do we either have the right diagnosis or is there a possibility that a, a patient might not, um, it, it, there's something in their genetics that, mm -hmm. that predisposes them to not respond to those proton pump inhibitors. There's ways, there's testing that we as gastroenterologists can do to look for that sort of stuff where 
we could place little probes in the esophagus that measure acid exposure and stuff like that and you know that those are things that could potentially help make a determination as to whether or not someone might be a, a better candidate mm -hmm. for surgery but the majority of patients if they have true reflux disease and they get placed on something like omeprazole or pantoprazole these are Prilosec or mm -hmm. Prevacid or Protonix or Nexium, they'll respond to that therapy, the majority of them. And why is it so important to treat it? Well, that's <coughs> where... Excuse me, I'm so sorry. That's okay. That, that's where we... Um, I'm surprised I haven't called Yeah, I know. Moment. You were the one that was beforehand. <laughs> I'm the scratching one. Um, the problem with having chronic acid <clears throat> injury come up into the esophagus is that um, there are some consequences that can occur to the esophagus. Esophagus doesn't like acid. It just doesn't like acid. The esophagus is, the lining of the esophagus is like your skin. And the skin doesn't like anything mm -mm. toxic or noxious getting on it. And so when, that ha when you start to get injury there, that, that, that can scar and you can develop something called a stricture, which is an area of tightness that can prevent food from going down uh, mm -hmm. into the stomach and that would then require some dilation, uh, so, some uh, procedures and maneuvers that we would have to do mm -hmm. to kind of open that up. But more importantly, a, 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 a major complication of untreated reflux disease uh, is something called Barrett's esophagus. It's a change in the lining of the esophagus where it no longer looks like skin, it starts to look more like intestine. And intestine aligning is okay with acid, you know, because when our stomach empties and has acid contents in it, it's going into intestine and the intestine doesn't mind that. But intestinal tissue in the esophagus is called Barrett's esophagus and that's not a good thing necessarily right. because even though it, it might be better tolerated as far as symptoms are concerned because you you know you you, you you're you're not getting as um, irritated and, mm -hmm. and feeling those symptoms as much when you have Barrett's that lining that change is a, a very strong risk factor for development of esophageal cancer and if Barrett's esophagus is there you have to know that it's there and you have to keep an eye on it so Anybody who's had long-standing reflux disease who has never had an upper endoscopy to look for Barrett's, particularly if you are a Caucasian male who is over the age of 50 and has had reflux symptoms for five or 10 years, if you're obese, regardless of what race or gender you are, or if you're a smoker, regardless of what race or gender you are, and you've had reflux symptoms, you wanna get your esophagus looked at because those are all risk factors for the development of this intestinal change in the esophagus that could potentially put you at risk of developing esophageal cancer. And that is not an easy cancer to treat. Not at all. You wanna find it early and, uh, and deal with it early. And you can actually find, uh, now, I, I don't want, people to think that just because you have Barrett's esophagus, you're going to get right. esophageal cancer. The actual incidence of developing esophageal cancer is, is very low, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. and, and esophageal cancer in the lower part of the esophagus does not occur if you don't have Barrett's esophagus. So if you do have Barrett's esophagus, that risk is there. And just like having a polyp in your colon, mm -hmm. that potential for that polyp to turn into colon cancer is there. You want to do something about it. And generally what you do with, with Barrett's esophagus, depending on how extensive it is mm -hmm. or what it looks like when you do the biopsies and what the cells look like, you can either continue to observe it, but observe it regularly to make sure it's not progressing to anything serious, or you want to get rid of it by, by uh, doing procedures to burn that, uh, uh, burn that tissue and make that tissue go away. And let's talk a little bit, and we're going to have to take a break here in just a minute, but I think we've got a little bit of time. Let's talk about what some of those procedures are, because once you've had persistent GERD, you're getting checked, uh-oh, we do see some Barrett's, right. you do a biopsy, you confirm it, then what do you do? Sure. So if the biopsies show no 
I'm going to use a medical term, but it's called dysplasia. That mm -hmm. means that the cells are starting to look abnormal under the microscope. If you don't have any dysplasia, you can continue to just observe that Barrett's and periodically do upper endoscopies generally every three years and, and do extensive biopsies to make sure you're mm -hmm. keeping an eye on things. But if you do have evidence of dysplasia, then there are treatments where you can put certain devices down into the esophagus. Uh, uh, most people do what's called radio frequency ablation or a procedure mm -hmm. called the halo procedure, and that is something that we offer also, where you're basically, uh, a, for lack of a better way of, of getting into to, of describing and getting into too much detail, you're basically burning that esophagus and then it re-epithelializes. It, it kind of gets covered over again with the normal squamous epithelium, the skin, and generally it'll take several treatments to get rid of that Barrett's tissue. But, but that's what we would normally uh, do. There are other ways, like you could freeze the tissue, but not many centers do that. And there are some other types of procedures that you can do. It is important to make sure that there's no abnormal growths, though, within mm -hmm. the Barrett's esophagus. If you see anything abnormal growing there, you generally want to remove that. And that can be done endoscopically also, um, where you, you basically take that tissue and, and and cut it off using special banding devices and and then a little metal wire loop that burns that tissue off. Yeah. So there are definitely some treatment options. It's time for us to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk some more about both GERD and Barrett's esophagus when we come back with more Health Talk. Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. El cine nos entretiene, pero esto no es la vida real. Lo que sí es real es que el cáncer colorectal es la segunda causa de muerte por cáncer entre hombres y mujeres. Los pólipos que lo causan pueden detectarse y eliminarse antes de que se convierten en cáncer. Pero tú lo puedes prevenir. Hágase un examen para detectar el cáncer colorectal. Yo lo hice. Podría salvar su vida. Si usted es mayor de 50 años, hágase el examen de detección. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. With me is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board-certified gastroenterologist with the Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. And tonight's topic has been GERD and Barrett's esophagus. And we're talking um, about Barrett's esophagus specifically before the break. We were talking about some of the treatment options available. And we had someone call in. They didn't want to share their question on the air, but they did want to see if we could maybe answer it. So Dr. Dobbin, I'm going to kind of get to this question. Um, and he's talking about a feeling of, the caller was saying he has a feeling of food getting stuck in his chest when he swallows. He feels like it's just stuck. It's a very weird feeling in his chest. And could it be from Barrett's esophagus? And um, what should he do? So that's an excellent question. So that symptom is something that we call, the medical term for it is dysphagia. It just means that it's abnormal swallowing, essentially. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem with the swallowing and initiating your swallowing, getting the food in the esophagus. That sensation of food getting stuck is what we call esophageal dysphagia. And that could potentially be related to Barrett's esophagus, but if it is related to Barrett's esophagus, it would be uh, more so because that Barrett's esophagus has some abnormal growth occurring within it. And that abnormal growth could be leading to esophageal cancer. That does not mean that that sensation means that you have esophageal cancer. It's far more common for that sensation to occur 
because you have either a benign little ring in the lower part of your esophagus. It's kind of like the web of tissue that you have between your index finger and your thumb. Mm -hmm. And it forms a little circle at the lower part of the esophagus and that acts like a shelf for food to get stuck on transiently. Or it could potentially indicate that you have some tightness in the lower part of the esophagus, something that we call a stricture, which is a little bit more significant scarring related to reflux disease. Um, if you do have a known diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus though, and you have swallowing symptoms, you always want to make sure you get that investigated and looked at. And generally, the best way to investigate and look at that is to do an upper endoscopy because Barrett's, as I mentioned earlier, is a risk factor for the development of esophageal cancer. And sometimes that symptom of food getting stuck could be related to an esophageal cancer. So we always recommend to patients that if you feel that sensation of food getting stuck, you ought to come and see us because mm -hmm. that's something we ought to look at and see. And if nothing else, if it's a little ring like we talked about, we can actually stretch that open at the time of an upper endoscopy and then make the swallowing issues become a lot easier for you. So it does not necessarily mean that it's something serious, serious or something right. bad, but it is something to have checked out because there may be a simple treatment Absolutely. that can totally improve that feeling. That's right. So if you are having that problem, definitely that's something to get checked out. So again, we've been talking about GERD, we've been talking about Barrett's. How often, if you have persistent GERD, does it develop into Barrett's esophagus? Uh, so the, the development of, of Barrett's itself is probably pretty low. Probably, uh, of all the people that have reflux disease, maybe a point one percent, so maybe one out of a thousand patients might actually develop Barrett's esophagus. It's it's really not super common for it to happen, and it tends to develop more so in the the demographic that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, the Caucasian male who is over the age of fifty who has had longstanding reflux disease. If you have a family history of Barrett's esophagus mm -hmm. or esophageal cancer then your risk might be a little bit higher in a particular individual. The majority of patients, though, with reflux disease are not going to go on to develop Barrett's esophagus, especially if you get the reflux disease under control at an early age. And once you have been diagnosed, if you have been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, how many of those patients then go on to develop esophageal cancer? Right, so, that, so it all depends on the level of dysplasia that mm -hmm. might be present. Uh, in those with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, it's probably about a 0.2%, so pretty small number. Mm -hmm. If you have low-grade dysplasia, that probably doubles, so it's like maybe around 0.4%, so pretty small. But if you have high-grade dysplasia, and that's where the cells are really starting to look mm -hmm. abnormal, then the risk goes up uh, mm -hmm. uh, much higher and can be as high as 4% or even higher depending on the studies. Sometimes even up into the early teens, like 14%. Wow. So, yeah. So high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's is, is an absolute indication to get your Barrett's tissue destroyed. You want to you wanna ablate Treat that. Treat it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You d definitely want to get that treated. And most patients with low-grade dysplasia, that's where the cells are just starting to look abnormal. Mm -hmm. Uh, those patients will usually be offered treatment also. Some will choose not to do it, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to do it, then you get to get your esophagus looked at every year as opposed to every three years, but, uh, but most patients will actually choose to get that ablated. Very good. Yeah. We've talked a lot about GERD and Barrett's esophagus. Of course, if you ever have questions, you can always check out the website for the Endoscopy Center. That's www.endo-world.com. Endo-world.com. They have a lot of frequently asked questions. You can get some contact information. You can always call the office. They have some wonderful people there that can answer your questions. It's a great thing to do if you are having persistent reflux, if you are concerned about Barrett's esophagus, if you have any of those questions, certainly give the office a call, potentially make an appointment to go in and see somebody. 
We are kicking off March. It is almost March. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. So I want to make a quick plug for colon cancer screening. Have your screening colonoscopy done. What is the magic age? So for those without a family history of colon cancer, age 50. So if you're 50 and you haven't had a colonoscopy within the past 10 years for screening purposes, come on in, get it done. If you're of African-American descent, we start at age 45. Please come in and get it done, it can save a life. It can absolutely save a life. Colon cancer is one of the cancers that is preventable if you are able to find it exactly. early. So during the Colon Cancer Awareness Month, it is always a good thing to talk about screening options, make sure you've had that done. If you've been thinking about it and putting it off, it's a great time to schedule that appointment, go in, have your colonoscopy done, your screening colonoscopy done. Again, as Dr. Dobbin said, it could absolutely save your life. It is just about time for us to go. We certainly appreciate you being with us this evening. We always enjoy having you. We enjoy your questions. Thank you for calling in. It's a great opportunity for us to speak with you and for you to have some doctor time. Again, March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Check your insides out. If you haven't made that appointment, make it your New Year's resolution, even though we're a couple months in. It's always a good thing to do. Do it during the month of March. You'll feel better. You won't be worrying anymore. It's absolutely something that could save your life. We thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month when we're back with more Health Talk.